Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an indefinable line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Makeshift Stories presents a monthly journey into the improbable. Today's story, 181, Vision City Part 2, read by Mitchell 2. Somewhere and sometime, the truth may be stranger than you can ever imagine. Aspens only live half a century or so. In my dream, the oldest of them, some 60 years on, 29 my junior, with leaves only on the branches stretching desperately south across the lake, was looking worse than a nine-decade-old human. But, despite its condition, the deciduous patriarch was challenging me. As the senior of its genetically identical colony, which, over the years, had invaded the land around my home, it was insisting my time here had come to an end. The colony had lost its patience, waiting to reforest the scar in their midst, which my house and garden occupied. An unexpected gust of wind suddenly hit it, like a plow rammed against a stubborn snowdrift. The patriarch screamed, age atrophied tissue tearing as the old tree had no choice but to bow to the overwhelming force, then an explosive crack woke me. Someone was pounding on the door, screaming my name. Dimitro, are you in there? I need help. It was the young woman. It took a while for my disoriented mind to recall her name. Naomi, I yelled back. What are you doing here? Hold on a minute, I was asleep. Hurry, she pleaded. Then the pounding stopped. I fumbled for the lights, and a dim glow filled the cabin. I had stayed up late that evening rereading my diary, so the solar batteries were unusually low. I fumbled around, found my coat, then navigated to the front door. As soon as I opened it, Naomi exploded through, looking like a rabbit with a coyote nipping at her heels. She stood for a moment, trying to catch her breath eyes darting frantically around the dimly lit room. She wore one of those new, ribbed-down sweaters over sweatpants and wasn't wearing any socks, and her fancy-looking trainers weren't tied up. I could see mud stains on the knees of her sweats, and the heels of both hands were red and scratched, hinting she had tripped and fallen many times in her rush to get here. It's a bear, a big one! Her eyes were wild with fear. After the rain stopped, I, I went to the outhouse. M Michael was asleep, so I took the pepper spray and a headlamp. On the way back, lightning hit almost on top of us, momentarily blinding me. But I saw something in the flash, standing by the shed, glowing. It was surrounded by a blue light, I think. She paused to collect her thoughts. But then there was a second flash, and I saw it clearly. It looked like a large bear standing on its hind legs. The thing suddenly turned and started toward me. I shot the pepper spray at it and ran. I thought I could hear it crashing through the bushes, but it must have turned around and gone back for Michael. I took our pepper spray. Michael doesn't have anything to protect himself. We've got to help. Do you have a rifle? Panic was splashed across her face. You said there was a blue glow? I asked, but really didn't need her confirmation. The fluorescence always announced its presence. I, I'm not so sure now, she hesitated. It, it was after the lightning struck. It may have been an afterimage. That makes more sense. Why would a bear glow, right? But that doesn't matter right now. We've got to go help Michael. Come on, Naomi pleaded. I didn't argue. I threw on my coat, then grabbed the axe from beside the fireplace. It was a pointless gesture to ease Naomi's fears. The wind picked up as we made our way back to town, along the old lake road, following the narrow cone of Naomi's headlamp. It rattled the aspen leaves until they sounded like rain. When Naomi looked the other way, I turned toward the mine and saw a faint blue glow, 
which seemed to evaporate under my gaze. Good. Stay there. I projected the thought, hoping it would respect my request for once. What are you looking at? Naomi questioned, turning around. Her headlamp swung toward me, blinding me to the night beyond reach of its glare. This was why I never used a flashlight at night. Did the bear swing around behind us? Her voice trembled. No, there's no bear. Let's get going. I know you're worried about your friend. We could hear Michael before we arrived. He was calling Naomi's name. She yelled back as we broke out of the forest into the clearing around the makeshift runway. Tension draining away, Naomi rushed ahead to embrace Michael. I thought you might have been hit by lightning or gotten disoriented and wandered off, Michael explained hurriedly, then released Naomi and noticed the condition of her clothes. There was a bear. It charged me, so I peppered it and ran to Dimitro's for help, she blurted out. It was glowing, and, and I, 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 thought, I, I thought it was going to break into the shed. A glowing bear? He noted skeptically. I was woken by the lightning strike. I think the radio tower got hit. Michael jumped with a start when he noticed me lurking in the shadows, axe in hand. Oh, Dimitro, thanks for coming. For a second, you look like a bad cliché from a horror film. He laughed nervously. Wouldn't have helped anyway. I admitted, leaning the axe against a boulder at the edge of the clearing, unless it was a tree that decided to chase Naomi. You can stay with me for the rest of the night if you want. I've got a fire going, so the place will be a lot warmer than that shed, I offered, sensing that neither really wanted to stay there tonight. Michael, it was just outside the shed door after the lightning hit, and it was glowing. I know that makes no sense, but I swear it was glowing. Naomi repeated earnestly. Sorry, I, I didn't see it, Michael apologized, swinging his headlamp around to look for tracks, but found nothing. Maybe it was just a shadow or something, Naomi finally admitted, but I could tell she really didn't believe that. She looked accusingly at me for a second, as if she suspected I knew more than I was admitting. The next morning, after breakfast, Naomi and Michael returned to the shed to get their gear for the day. Michael had convinced Naomi she had seen St. Elmo's fire, a rare effect of a close lightning strike. Against my advice, Michael decided to explore the old mine site, and, in the afternoon, Naomi returned with her recording equipment. I made more coffee from the beans they had given me, then we sat down around the kitchen table to continue. Naomi played with her recorder. Once she was happy, she jabbed a red button and nodded at me. Tell me more about what happened in the mine. The glowing rocks. What happened after that? I took a long sip of the coffee, savoring its rich, smoky flavor as it trickled down my throat. That wasn't a bear last night, Naomi. I admitted feeling the time had finally come to reveal the truth. Then what was it? Um, I waffled. It's hard to explain, but I know what you saw last night was not a bear. It was the thing I met in the mine 60 years ago. So, you're saying there's a ghost here? Is it a person you knew? Someone who died in an accident? You've been here alone a long time, Dimitro. I can't imagine what that would be like. Maybe you're crazy. Maybe I'm getting dementia and hallucinating. Or maybe ambient radiation from the rocks around here has finally scrambled my brains. Is that what you're thinking? I can assure you I'm very sane. Hear me out. Naomi's finger hovered over the stop button for a moment. Then she withdrew it and leaned away, nuzzling her coffee cup in her hands. Look. I don't really understand what it is, but not understanding something doesn't mean it isn't real. When I was drilling into that new ore vein 60 years ago for the samples to assay, I disturbed something, some consciousness in the rock which had been asleep for millennia, and it's been awake ever since. It's the reason I can't leave. 
I know you might think your ghost is real, Dimitro, but it was just a bear last night. It wasn't, I insisted. You don't understand yet, and I had hoped you would never have to. After the night I drilled into the vein, I had no choice but to move out here, near the mine site, and watch the town boom, then shrivel up, like a desiccated body when the price of uranium plummeted. The Three Mile Island accident, and later, Chernobyl. They were demonstrations. There have been many others along the way. Wind scale in the UK. The Lucens reactor in Switzerland. And others that were covered up. Demonstrations of what? Of what it could do. I did my best to contain it. Are you trying to claim that a ghost at a remote uranium mine caused those accidents? That's crazy. Naomi gave me an incredulous stare. It's not a ghost, I corrected. It's a spirit. A conscious manifestation of the natural world. An aspect of Gaia, although I never believed in that sort of thing. I don't know exactly what it is. It's never told me, but its lifespan is geologic, and it was meant to rest until the end of time. I woke it, but we, humanity, have prevented it from going back to sleep. It's angry with us, and very impatient. The ghost talks to you? But... Naomi began to object. Naomi, bears don't glow, and bears aren't accompanied by a chorus of voices. I know what you saw and heard last night, even if you refuse to admit it yourself. I thought you might be ready to believe. Now, I'm not so sure. We should stop for today. I reached across the table and hit the stop button. A few minutes later, Michael appeared. They packed their sleeping bags from the night before and left for the shed. At that moment, I was convinced they weren't going to come back and imagined them on the sat phone to the air charter company, trying to convince the dispatcher to fly them back early and free them from the old crazy hermit while the going was good. That evening, for the first time since they had arrived, it came after sunset. I was sitting on my front stairs, watching the twilight birth the first stars of the night, when I saw the distinctive blue glow flow through the trees from the road and heard the familiar low muttering of a thousand indiscernible voices buzzing around it like angry wasps. At seven or eight feet high, I could imagine how, in the right circumstances, someone might mistake it for a large bear standing on its hind legs. But the resemblance stopped there. It looked more like a cloud of broken rock, suspended in a glowing blue gel, which made it deceptively agile and quiet. In an instant, it was standing over me, casting its sickly glow onto the porch. What I considered its face gave me a pitying look, like an ancient dog's master who knows their faithful pet is on its last legs. Was it considering what the humane thing to do would be? You are not well. It let me know through the thousand buzzing mumbles infesting the air around it. But the arrangement must continue. It will exceed your life. I know, I nodded, feeling the wrinkled, paper-thin skin on the back of one hand. But I've kept my part of the deal. You haven't. You've done things. Only to remind you of what is at stake, it buzzed. If the responsibility is transferred to another, the world can continue as is. It stood there in silence, keeping me company as it always had. Both a friend and a demon, take your pick, until the moon rose. Then it drifted away on the evening breeze. I didn't sleep that night. Dimitro, we're here! Michael yelled as soon as they entered the clearing, which passed as my front yard. 
I had heard their clumsy footsteps almost a mile away, so I had plenty of time to get ready for them. I chose to meet Naomi and Michael outside on the steps. Come in. I have some of your amazing coffee on. I greeted and waved the two of them in. They exchanged awkward glances, so I assumed they had decided to leave early, and for their sake, hoped it was indeed the case. We huddled around the small Formica table, cuddling our coffees in the crisp air of the morning, until Michael broke the brittle silence. We want to take you over to the old mine to get some pictures and video. His request caught me off guard. Maybe even check out one of the old mine shafts. I was able to pull the chain link away from the entrance to one yesterday and explore it a bit. We're thinking we could record you talking about your ghost there. That'd make an awesome video. Noticing my surprise, he added, and Naomi told me about your ghost. I got the impression yesterday Naomi thinks I'm hallucinating the whole thing. Just a crazy old man who talks to an invisible glowing buddy. I banged my mug down on the table and watched their reactions carefully. It's real to you, and that's all that matters. It actually makes your story more interesting. Naomi explained, glancing at Michael, who nodded in agreement. It's an angle we hadn't anticipated, but we want to run with it. We'll frame this as a real ghost story, so it'll appeal to the paranormal audience. Stuff about hauntings are really popular these days. She smiled. Telling it from inside one of the mine shafts? Well, that'll push it over the top. Noting my reluctance, Naomi added, We don't have to go in far. It doesn't have to be the actual spot. No one will know the difference. This isn't a good idea, I protested. I checked out the perfect spot yesterday. It's only about five meters into a shaft, and the cribbing looks good. Nothing's fallen down, Michael pointed out, as if he were an expert at judging dangerous situations he knew nothing about. I suppose once I had the same false confidence before my bravado had become a victim of experience and age. A collapse is only one of the dangers. There are other unknowns. Naomi looked disappointed at my reaction. If you don't want to go, you can tell me the end of your story, and I'll retell it in the mine. But that won't be as dramatic. I understand your fear. She had no idea I wasn't afraid for myself. So, drama is your goal. And for that you are willing to go how far? I questioned, looking from one to the other, seeing the determination in their unlined faces, and knowing they would not leave without doing this. So I finally consented, and hoped they might get lucky. Okay, I'll go. I hadn't been back to the mine site since the cleanup in the early 1990s. After that, no one had ever come back to check on the place, and it hadn't really been secured very well. The contractor probably assumed they didn't have to lock things down tight, as I was the only person living nearby, and, being an ex-miner, wasn't foolish enough to go into the old workings. But, just as Michael had claimed, the chain link over the entrance to shaft four could be pulled away with minimal effort. I stood outside in the crisp fall sun as my two companions hauled their gear into the dark maw of the mine shaft. Naomi and Michael had brought along two camera lights, which they claimed would run off of heavy batteries they had packed in earlier. The air was cool, but the sun warmed my skin making me feel a bit like a lizard warming itself on a rock. Finally, Naomi came to get me. I luxuriated in the warmth for a few more seconds, then reluctantly followed her into the cold depths of the human-made gash in the ancient rock. As soon as my eyes adapted, I saw the artificial digital glare of white LED panels, which had been aimed to create a small stage where I was to perform. Water dripping down the wall sparkled in the light, giving the roughly hewn granite a slick appearance. Naomi motioned me over and positioned me at the center of the illuminated spot. Then she moved over to stand beside Michael. Just talk to me like we do back at your cabin. 
Forget the camera is here, she instructed. I fidgeted with my hands, eventually deciding to stick them into my pants pockets, then tried not to look nervous as my eyes, blinded by the camera lights, tried to scour the blackness beyond for signs. Just start a bit before you left off yesterday. You were in the mine alone at night, she prompted, mistaking my hesitation for camera shyness. Resigned to the inevitable, I finally sighed. Well, it happened like this. It was in the dead of a winter night. If you had thrown boiling water into the air outside, it would have frozen into ice crystals before hitting the ground. Through the glare of the lights, I could just make out Naomi smiling and encouraging me to keep going. Our shift hadn't been making quota, and I had been asked to stay behind to drill core samples from a new vein to assay the quality. It was against regulations, but I was the only person underground. I had stopped to cool the drill when the lights began to flicker. At first, I thought it was an intentional effect as the camera lights cut in and out. A cheap embellishment to blur the line between fiction and reality, but the expressions on their faces hinted at surprise and concern. Michael started wiggling cables, and Naomi motioned for me to stop talking. I felt it a few seconds before I saw the blue glow drift out of the darkness. Counterintuitively, it had entered Shaft 4 from the outside, cutting off any possibility of escape. But I suppose that made sense, as I had first encountered it in Shaft 1. Naomi and Michael followed my gaze, then froze as their equipment shut down. We stood so still we could have been mistaken for three cadaverous stalagmites. Its cloud of muttering voices grew until one finally surfaced. The time has come, it said without saying the words. Naomi and Michael, wide-eyed, drew closer together, making me momentarily jealous. I had been alone sixty years ago when it forced humanity's burden on me. I could tell it was entrapping the two of them in the same web of responsibility. Their expressions bore bewilderment, resignation, and horror. The old twin otter turned, then taxied up to the shed at the end of the runway. Its pilot cut the engines, then popped the rear door open. Maggie, who had done my supply drops for the past fifteen years, ducked out. Dimitro, I was expecting those two kids I dropped off last week. I shrugged. They've decided to stay for a while, so I'm taking their place on the way back. Maggie nodded skeptically. I never expected to see you on my plane, except in a pine box. Really? I smiled. I never intended to stay so long as to need a pine box for transportation. Any seat will do just nicely. She laughed, then motioned me on board. My pack was small. Just a change of clothes for the warmer southern climate. Really, there was nothing else I wanted to bring. I was leaving Fission City with the clothes on my back, just as I had arrived. Last time I was on this plane, you probably hadn't earned your pilot's license. I joked as I stowed my bag and settled into a seat just behind the pilot's cabin. There was no one else on board. Maggie checked my seatbelt then went forward and buckled herself in. I'm on a tight schedule, she apologized. Are you sure those two are going to be all right? Uh, sure. They've got a sat phone and enough supplies for a couple of months. They're determined to make this work. They'll be okay. Maggie swung the otter around, then opened the throttle, making the old machine's body vibrate in protest as we bounced down the pitted runway. Just before it ended at the lake shore, she pulled back on the yoke, and the stuttering stopped as the lake's surface dropped away, and I was finally free, forty years later than I had planned. It had taken a while for Naomi and Michael to accept the situation they had stumbled into. Initially, they had tried to rationalize the incident in Shaft 4 away 
as a group hallucination, and I couldn't fault them for that. I had tried to do the same in my day, but the spirit of the rock kept returning. I had unwittingly awoken it sixty years ago, and it couldn't slip back into unconsciousness until the power inherent in the ores we had been mining had been returned to the soil and buried. It had only two choices, it had explained to Naomi and Michael. Wait for humanity to fix what we had inadvertently disturbed, or accelerate the process, creating a nuclear disaster to wipe us out so nature could get on with the business of healing. It tended toward the latter, and sixty years ago I had convinced it to wait by promising to stay, promising to entertain it, to keep it occupied while we came to our senses as a species. But now I had passed that burden on and was finally free. Naomi and Michael had reluctantly accepted the terms and the stakes. They loved humanity as much as I do. I looked through the window beside me and watched the occasional wart of human activity punctuate the forest below, oblivious to the delicate balance I, and now Naomi and Michael, had dedicated our lives to maintain. On the other side of the plane, the sun burst into the cabin, warming the right side of my face as Maggie banked south. I was at peace at last. Without warning, a lightning rod of pain knifed through my chest, and I instantly understood that the ancient Aspen and the spirit of the rock had been right. My time here was over. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB Financial. To listen to other great APN podcasts, such as Press Start to Join, where hosts Josh and Alan talk about video games, movies, TV, comics, Star Wars, and more, please head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com. This episode is brought to you by Alberta Health Services. We ask these children if they know when to go to emergency and when there are other options. If, like, your heart stopped beating. If you were really sick. If you were super-duper hurt, you'd come. They're there to treat people that are really sick or really hurt and they need attention right away. If you have an emergency, we're here to help. If it's not an emergency, you have options. Take control of your health. Call 811 or visit ahs.ca slash options. The Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB, is happy to be partnering with Seat Giant to offer you a deal on tickets to major sporting events, big concerts, popular theater throughout North America, and more. Whether you're at home or on vacation, check Seat Giant for tickets to the hottest theater, music, and sports events such as The Whalers or A Chorus Line. Visit SeatGiant.ca to find tickets. Use the promo code APN at checkout to get 5% off your purchase. You'll save a bit, and the network gets a little cut of that purchase too. Makeshift Stories is released twice a month, usually around the 1st and the 15th. Today's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Too. Opening and closing music was composed and recorded by David Hume. You can find more about David at davidhume.me. We want your feedback, so please send us an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. You can help us out by telling your friends about us and getting them to head over to Apple Podcasts or their favorite podcast provider to subscribe. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.